Tom is a chief scientist, or the chief scientist with Plant Nutrition Canada, uh, supporting the nutrient stewardship programs of the fertilizer industry. He chairs the International Fertilizer Association Scientific Panel on Responsible Plant Nutrition. Based in Guelph, Ontario, he served for 25 years with the International Plant Nutrition Institute and the Potash and Phosphate Institute. Dr. Brulsma has been recognized as a fellow of the American Society of Agronomy, the Soil Science Society of America, and the Canadian Society of Agronomy. He has agronomic research experience with the University of Minnesota and with MCC in Bangladesh. So we are going to run Tom's presentation. He is here live today uh, online as well to answer questions. So again, if anyone has questions, we will take those in the audience or for those who are participating virtually, pop those questions in the chat and we will address those later on as well. Hello, I'm Tom Brosma with Plant Nutrition Canada and I'm delighted to have this opportunity today to speak to you at the Mac Manitoba Agronomist Conference for 2022. My topic is Furthering 4R to Verify Sustainable Emissions Reductions. I'll be dividing my talk into three pieces, uh, first looking at the scope at various scales, global, uh, the United States, Canada, and Africa, and in each of these, how 4R is already being referenced in emissions reductions programs. Second, I'll look at uh, another approach which has been proposed, which is a simple focus on reducing nitrogen surplus. And I'll show that reducing nitrogen surplus is a part of 4R programs and can contribute to reducing emissions from fertilizer use as well. And then I'll talk more uh, largely about um, including 4R in emission reduction programs and uh, provide some direction uh, to programs that are ongoing. A lot of uh, the content of today's talks can also be seen in this soils and crops article that's referenced here. What's the scope of 4R practices for reducing emissions from fertilizer? And that showed up in the November, December edition of Crops and Soils. The, interest, the uh, important uh, fact to recognize from the nitrogen cycle is that the main emission from nitrogen fertilizer is nitrous oxide, and that nitrous oxide is emitted into a global pool. We don't have local issues with high concentrations of nitrous oxide um, choking people or causing impacts on wildlife. Its simple effect is up in the atmosphere where it has actually two effects. It serves as a greenhouse gas and it also can be an agent in depleting the stratospheric ozone layer. So there's strong public interest in reducing the emissions of nitrous oxide. And it's very important. The other thing to note about it is the thin arrow designates that those nitrous oxide emissions, which can come directly from nitrate by denitrification, or during the process of nitrification, the conversion of ammonium to nitrate in the soil. And in both those instances, it's only a small percentage of the uh, nitrogen transformed or the nitrogen added that's actually lost as nitrous oxide. So we don't have a quantitative loss uh, problem here but we do have a very large impact since the nitrous oxide molecule is uh, around 273 times as effective as a carbon dioxide molecule in uh, warming um, the atmosphere. Let's put the emissions from fertilizer use in context. And this is looking at data for 2019 to 2020, um, greenhouse gas emissions in million tons, million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents. And the total greenhouse gas emissions for the world are estimated by the IPCC at around 59 billion tons, plus or minus 6.6 .6 billion. Uh, for the USA, it's about 6,600 uh, million tons, and for Canada, 740 million tons. Of those, nitrous oxide is a small proportion, 4 to 5 percent, 2,700 for the world, plus or minus 1,600. The uncertainty on total nitrous oxide emissions is larger than for the other greenhouse gases. 
In the USA, 440, in Canada, 40. Nitrous oxide from agriculture comprises the majority of total nitrous oxide emissions induced by human activity. And so for the world, 1,800 um, million tons of CO2 equivalents. And <clears throat> what we're looking at for the USA is 350 and Canada, 24. Of the nitrous oxide from agriculture, a large part does arise from fertilizer use. Uh, in the red, we see here figures that are, include both the direct and indirect emissions arising from nitrogen fertilizer application. 634 million tons for the world, 83 for the US and 13 for Canada. And that arises from um, fertilizer, current fertilizer and nitrogen use levels of uh, 111 million tons for the world, around 12 for the USA and 2.6 for Canada. So what's the scope for reductions? Uh, recently, the International Fertilizer Association worked with an organization called Systemic, uh, and they published a report in September that looked at, um, you know, what are those emissions? And the, some of the figures I just showed you on the previous slide come from there. They look at the total emissions from fertilizer uh, as amounting to 717 million tons of CO2 equivalents. And they, con they concluded, looking at the options to reduce uh, the emissions, that if we increased global nitrogen use efficiency from the current level of around 50% globally to 70%, that could reduce emissions by 320 million tons. That's a fairly significant number. Then, and in inhibitors could uh, reduce emissions by a further 185 million tons. And the remainder, uh, it would be very hard to get to a true net zero. So it would have to come from soil carbon storage. We know that nitrogen is involved to some degree in soil carbon storage, but the estimates of what we can do on a net basis for removing CO2 from the air range pretty widely from 400 to 6,500 million tons of CO2. Looking a little more in detail at uh, the uh, emissions where they arise, um, the emissions from fertilizer in their report were um, uh, attributed mostly to nitrous oxide, but also a small component is the carbon dioxide that is emitted after urea is applied. The urea molecule contains a carbon atom. Uh, that carbon atom generally ends up as CO2. If you look at it quantitatively, for every kilogram of nitrogen that you're applying to the soil, there'll be 1.6 kilograms CO2 emitted. But that's small compared to the greenhouse gas effect of the nitrous oxide emitted. The nitrous oxide, if you look at most greenhouse gas inventories, about three quarters of that is attributed to direct emissions arising from the fertilizer application, and another one quarter from indirect emissions arising from the nitrate or ammonia losses that um, uh, arise from the uh, nitrogen fertilizer application. They project mostly for the future for 2050, and they project that business as usual growth in demand for agriculture is going to lead to increased use of nitrogen fertilizers and thus increased emissions. And so our starting point here is not 717, it's uh, closer to 805. And then we have to look at what's potential to reduce. By improving nitrogen use efficiency, you can see here there's a, a range that's estimated. It's the largest component. And then an additional effect of utilizing uh, inhibitors of nitrification that include polymer coatings, um, as well as anything that controls the uh, release of ammonia into the soil and thus uh, limits the process of nitrification. Additional uh, reductions can come from crop rotations and land sparing, but they get to a minimum by which they say at least 210 million tons worldwide will need to be obtained by soil carbon sequestration if we're going to claim net zero by 2050. So that's a very ambitious scope, and it's also a very long time frame, uh, and that's important things to remember when we talk about this uh, attaining of a 71% reduction of the emissions from fertilizer, then this will take is a very ambitious effort as well in that 
uh, there's a large amount of things beyond the management of fertilizers that goes into the improvement of nitrogen use efficiency. The same study has a case study for the USA looking uh, and focused on corn in the corn belt. Um, they attribute about um, the corn production, the nitrogen fertilizer used in corn production, with 45 million tons of CO2, mostly as N2O and look at um, ways to reduce that. And they re recognize the scope in the USA is less than global because uh, the efficiency, the, crop, the nitrogen use efficiency in US crop production is already considerably higher than 50%. But they propose that by eliminating nitrogen surplus, essentially moving NUE to 100%, which it's quite questionable whether that can be attained, there could be a reduction of six to 12 million tons of uh, CO2 equivalents. And that by doubling the use of inhibitors uh, there to cover um, the majority of fertilizer used, there'd be a further seven to 10 million tons of uh, reduction possible. So the total reduction possible is maybe 30 to 50% rather than 71%. When we've looked at the scope in Canada, there's a target of an absolute 30% reduction that uh, was announced by the federal government in uh, December 2020. And what this, uh, we have recently you know, with Fertilizer Canada put out a report analyzing the economics of adoption of practices that could attain reductions. And the conclusion of the report is essentially that meeting this target would require either a very large cost share or it would result in reduced crop production. Crop production and yields are on increasing trends, and I will show you some data in the next few slides. Uh, the report also concludes that for our implementation on a reasonable basis could provide a 14% reduction by 2030 while continuing to increase crop yields. And in fact, it's assuming that crop yields can continue to increase. We look at the trends in crop production uh, on the basis of nitrogen removal, and you compare the United States to Canada, you can see what a very large role soybeans play in the nitrogen budget of crop production in the States. Uh, and soybean production has been increasing, yields have been increasing, maize yields, grain yield, corn grain yields have been increasing. And here we have crop nitrogen removal in teragrams. That's the same thing as a million metric tons. So in the US, there is approximately 12 million metric tons of fertilizer used, and the crop removal is, exceeds that a little bit. Um, what we haven't accounted for here are other sources of nitrogen inputs as well. well. We'll look at some nitrogen use efficiency figures. In Canada, note we have a different scale here. We're up to, the scale runs up to two and a half million metric tons. And the, we see what's been, what's the dominant part of our um, and nitrogen outputs in Canada has traditionally been wheat and other grains, but very, very much more recently, canola has been increasing tremendously and adding to uh, the smaller amounts of um, nitrogen removal by soybeans and corn as well. Pulses are also a significant uh, nitrogen removal in Canada. When we look and start to compare the uh, countries for nitrogen use efficiency by plotting the nitrogen outputs, and here, I'm sorry, it's in kilograms per hectare, which is just a number that's a little bit bigger than a pound per acre. The, you look at nitrogen outputs and nitrogen inputs, and anything that lies along the one-to-one -one uh, line would be a, uh, the one-to-one -one line would be 100% nitrogen use efficiency. This line here shows you 90%. This line shows you 50%. What we see is each dot then represents a year in Canada's crop production history and uh, comparing the uh, outputs against the inputs. Uh, crop removal against the inputs, which is, are the sum of fertilizer, manure, legume fixation, and atmospheric deposition to cropland. These numbers are fairly new. Uh, they were just put out by the fertilizer, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization in cooperation with the International Fertilizer Association. It's a very uniform data set. Uh, I'm not quite sure that they have their, their uh, the, the kilograms per hectare units correct yet, but at the same time, they are very good on um, the uh, unis using uniform procedures to compare countries across the world. 
As you see in Canada, uh, we had a time in the 60s where uh, nitrogen use efficiency was extremely high, but it's a little bit artificial in that a lot of that nitrogen use efficiency was depending on annual mineralization, annual net mineralization of nitrogen from the soil and thus depleting soil organic matter. As we, time has gone along, uh, outputs have increased from approximately 20 kilograms per hectare to 60 kilograms per hectare, it essentially yields tripling over that time period. And uh, the uh, concomitantly, of course, we've got the nitrogen inputs increasing as well. Uh, we don't have nitrogen use efficiency declining uh, anymore. The, uh, the dots seem to fall along the 64% line. Uh, but productivity has been increasing. In contrast, in the U.S., we've got um, productivity increasing along with uh, nitrogen use efficiency increasing and a fairly impressive NUE of 71%. But if you consider how much of that nitrogen budget is comprised by soybeans, it's not too surprising. Soybeans fix their own nitrogen and are basically by assumption in this uh, approach uh, at about 100, almost 100% 100 efficiency. And if we compare it to the world, we can see that you know, worldwide as well, both productivity and nitrogen use efficiency have been improving, but in Canada, we are ahead of the world average. We did one small study as well on the scope for 4R in reducing potential emissions in sub-Saharan Africa. The 4R solution project is something which uh, attempts to introduce 4R practices to smallholder farmers in Ethiopia, in Ghana, and Senegal. Within this project, we engaged some scientists to make some um, realistic presumptions about what kind of uh, practices we could see in place by 2030 or by 2050. And then we looked at the FAO projections for increases in nitrogen fertilizer use in sub-Saharan Africa as well. And as you can see, that if we rely on the current tier one um, calculated methods for nitrous oxide emission, the nitrous oxide emission in terms of million tons of CO2 equivalent will become quite substantial by 2050. The green bars represent the potential for our reduction with fairly modest assumptions about uh, the percentage of uh, nitrous oxide emission reduction that would result through use of the right source applied at the right time, right uh, place, and uh, at the right rate. And also looking at assumptions for um, uh, percent adoption. Uh, these assumptions are fairly conservative, 30% adoption of 4R by 2030 and 50% by 2050. You can see that there is a substantial amount of reduction, but there's still a long way to go before uh, we can envision a future nitrogen use in sub-Saharan Africa that is net zero. I'm going to talk a little bit now in the second part of my talk about um, nitrogen surplus, reducing that nitrogen surplus and the strengths and limitations of that approach. And here we're defining a nitrogen surplus as simply the amount of nitrogen applied, it's often just fertilizer, but it should include manure if manure is actually applied as well, and subtracting the amount removed by the crop. So it's a simple amount. Uh, if you're at 100% nitrogen use efficiency, uh, this surplus goes to zero but that is very difficult to attain. The strengths of this approach is that, is that it's a very measurable outcome. It's an outcome-based, it reflects uh, all the management practices on a farm, and it is measurable. It is something that could be reported. It does relate to every loss pathway. If you consider nitrate contamination of groundwater, uh, volatilization of nitrogen, all and uh, losses of uh, uh, nitrogen that impact water quality in other ways, uh, all of those can be presumed to reduce as nitrogen surpluses are reduced. This approach applies no limit to yield gain. It's not a fixed limit on inputs, and so it allows for productivity at high levels, um, uh, provided that productivity is obtained and with reasonable amounts of uh, nitrogen fertilizer application. 
It also includes some of the upstream emissions. If we look at uh, monitoring nitrogen surpluses, if we reduce the nitrogen surpluses by reducing the amount of nitrogen fertilizer applied per unit of uh, crop produced, then we've also um, uh, reduced the emissions that were associated with production of nitrogen that would have been used but is not being used. So some very strong strengths in, the, in that approach. But there are limitations to it as well. And the, the primary one being that it doesn't, it neglects independent effects of inhibitors that I've already shown um, are, can be considered to be separate from improvement in nitrogen use efficiency. It neglects source effects, such as um, the choice of um, uh, urea versus other forms where urea has emission of uh, carbon dioxide. It uh, involves trade offs with soil carbon. If we reduce nitrogen surpluses to zero, we may actually be mining in situations and encouraging situations where uh, soils, uh, soil organic matter depletion is being encouraged by uh, excessive tillage uh, in order to get the nitrogen out of that soil, and which is not sustainable. And the other limitation is that uh, it only uh, provides a limited emission reduction, and I will show you some quantitative numbers there. My main point is that a 4R program should be looking at nitrogen surplus and look, should be looking at managing it as well. 4R builds on the strengths and addresses most of the limitations of a nitrogen surplus approach. Um, the publication is available um, online at the DOI indicated here, uh, published in Earth's Future. So the, that publication has a sing, simple quantitative line based on 286 sites, mostly corn, but including wheat and canola as well, and including some sites in Manitoba. So what I've worked out here are some numbers for how this might apply to a typical canola producer on the prairies, uh, producing an av today's average yield of 42 bushels per acre. And then uh, on this curve, this curve re relates the size of the nitrogen surplus to measured nitrous oxide emissions across these sites. So that curve was derived from those many op observations. Um, and you can see it increases more or less exponentially with nitrogen surplus, which is something that uh, would make sense. Uh, <clears throat> Where we are right now in terms of uh, yield is the black dot here. If a producer was producing that 42 bushels per acre canola with 85 uh, pounds per acre of fertilizer nitrogen, they'd be at 100% NUE and it'd be, their emissions would be approximately 600 kilogram CO2 equivalents per hectare on this figure there probably could be some adjustments for um, the, wherever um, the, the site is located. Um, if uh, we're closer to where producers are today uh, in terms of their nitrogen use efficiency, which is closer to 48% than to 65%, um, we're probably around here. So then the total amount of emission reduction by eliminating your nitrogen surplus would be a little in excess of 125 uh, kilograms per of CO2 equivalents per hectare, but that's a very difficult target. Um, a more realistic target might be to move canola to 65% NUE, growing 42 bushels with 130 pounds per acre. Uh, and so um, the approach uh, makes a lot of sense in situations where uh, nitrogen use is unreasonably high and where there's huge opportunity to increase nitrogen use efficiency. There you would docu you could document and use this to, to say that uh, evidence shows this would reduce the nitrous oxide emissions. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't capture all and uh, additional reductions could be achieved uh, by looking at the 4R practices employed and to see whether they include nitrification inhibitors or other sources of nitrogen that emit less nitrous oxide. The 4R framework is, was designed to be simple, relate source rate, time, and place of nutrient application to economic, environmental, and social sustainability impacts. But the real picture is more complicated. 
There are numerous indicators that could be used. And in this diagram, we have 12 of them. We do have greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, that's relevant to uh, what I've been talking about here. Soil health is relevant in that it represents the soil carbon sink as well. Nutrient use efficiency is an outcome that's relevant, and so is productivity. So <clears throat> we had a review of this whole 4R framework, which was originally published in 2012 by IPNI, a recently formed scientific panel on responsible plant nutrition uh, published a review of the 4R concept and a critique of it as well, and then suggested directions that the 4R nutrient stewardship uh, framework needs to move in in order to um, be successful. And what we concluded is that 4R is indeed relevant to each of the six actions that we have identified on this panel for um, responsible plant nutrition that uh, 4R is highly connected to the performance outcomes that are relevant. It's uh, site-specific and it's well-recognized around the world. Each of those uh, programs that I have mentioned so far have uh, recognized 4R practices. So our challenge then is to recognize that the impact of any specific combination of source rate, time, and place depends as well on the full management system of the farm, and and uh, and the larger context of responsible plant nutrition uh, in the industries that support agriculture as well. We proposed a number of areas in which um, we need to work on for for our systems, and the first is to integrate it with the future farming systems. We see farming systems that are moving in transition to becoming more regenerative, circular, and nature based. And there is soil conservation, there's integration with livestock, there's sustainable intensification and better human nutrition, all to be considered in that. And so for our programs need to be designed to support those transitions and to fit in context with them. And what is the right source rate time and place um, for uh, uh, the traditional system may not be the same as the ones for the future. There needs to be focus on data-driven digital solutions, GPS guidance, decision support tools, and there needs to be adaptive management for accelerated innovation, weather responsive sensing tools and crop models. We also looked at very specific principles for each of the four components of 4R, source rate, time, and place. And the big focus here was on right source, where we identified four new core principles. Uh, some of them are more um, uh, advanced than others. Uh, I'm going to focus here on the climate smart forms. And these are principles that we've added to the original principles as published by IPNI. So speaking of uh, climate smart forms, um, we have three attributes to a climate smart fertilizer. First, it needs to be produced with lower manufacturing uh, CO2 emissions, and that's green and blue ammonia. That's a little bit out of the scope for this talk today, but there's a large amount of talk and uh, investment going on in the industry to um, produce uh, ammonia with fewer CO2 emissions. And that's in connection with the hydrogen economy that's um, aspired to. Second is the inhibition of loss of nitrous oxide. Um, both inhibitors and polymer coated urea can be effective there. And then the third is to improve nitrogen use efficiency, looking at um, controlled release, stabilized and smart fertilizers, fertilizers that only activate and become soluble in the presence of a plant root. First of all, um, looking at fertilizers that emit less nitrous oxide, and there are numerous meta-analyses done by this time on the effect of nitrification inhibitors. In fact, just this past year uh, was published the first meta-analysis of meta-analyses. Uh, the one I'm showing here, this figure, each dot represents the finding of one meta-analysis of um, effect of nitrification inhibitor on nitrous oxide. And these are global studies um, they did this um, uh, study fairly uh, carefully, ensuring that there was no overlap or at least limited overlap between the different studies that they had. They found five different published meta-analyses that were independent and found uh, similar 
percent reductions of uh, nitrous oxide emission from arising from the use of nitrification inhibitors. And that's exceeding 40% reduction uh, relative to going without the um, inhibitor. And the important thing to remember here is these are studies where everything else was held constant. This is just the application of the inhibitor. We also know that these products can be used to reduce rate and get the same yield or um, at the same rate uh, should be capable of producing higher yields if the yield potential is there. So urease inhibitors even are, are less effective. Uh, slow and controlled release fertilizer is a little less effective than a nitrification inhibitor. Um, and uh, co the combination of a nitrification and urease inhibitor is quite effective as well. So we have some very effective, simple solutions where you simply uh, change the right source and reduce emissions. There is, they are comparable in scope to the optimization of fertilizer rate, but we have to recognize that a lot of studies that report optimization of fertilizer rate they find what that optimum rate was after the study has been completed. The difficult part is to optimize rate by, by predicting a rate to be applied at the time of application. That's still a challenging component because that can vary year to year with weather. We have new core principles as well for rate, time, and place, and most of them look at addressing variability in crop response, addressing changes through the growing season, and in placement, placing the nutrients to avoid loss wherever possible. When we look at ways to address weather variability, model-based nitrogen decision support is certainly a tool that can be used, um, usually something that taps into Current dynamic weather forecasts, particularly looking at the precipitation, plugging that into models of soil and crop processes using the location-specific weather, and then providing input to the user. And there are several examples of these being offered by various um, uh, fertilizer retailers uh, in, uh, across uh, North America and around the world. Climate Field View, Granular Agronomy, and Yara with the, its acquisition of um, Cornell University's ADAPT-N model. So there are digital solutions being provided for nitrogen management, and these generally can run under a 4R banner as well. Then the third area of improvement that uh, for our frameworks need to consider is the sustainability performance reporting. And in the original vision, this would be done strictly for um, fertilizer use. But really, we've come to the realization that this has to be done as a team effort. There's a whole lot more of uh, agricultural crop management that is important to sustainability that ties in with fertilizer management. And so it really needs to be done as, as a whole. Tracking practices at the farm level, sharing the track data to report performance, and looking at all three components of economic, environmental, and social sustainability. The field print calculator of the field to market initiative is one example that's been evolving over time and then looks at a balance of uh, attributes like land use efficiency, uh, which is sort of the reciprocal of yield and soil erosion, greenhouse gas emissions, energy use and irrigation water use. And I believe they have evolved this uh, concept to consider more indicators as well. In Canada, we've had work on the Roundtable for Sustainable Crops and a metrics platform as well. And that, that needs continued support. It needs continued collaborative action. In the uh, conclusion to our issue brief on furthering for our nutrient stewardship, we have a section on who needs to do what. And yeah, some of those things are easy to say, but a lot harder to do. And we do put, on, but every one of these partners needs to be working together if we're going to be able to move for our forward to actually attain reductions in emissions. Fertilizer industry needs to collaborate to put for our practices into sustainability standards and collaborate with whom? Well, the rest of the industry and with government. Agri-service providers need to facilitate farm reporting of for our practices and outcomes. Farmers need to share data on their 4R practices and their outcomes. And of course, this is going to involve developing and building trust between um, and among 
agri-service providers, farmers, and governments. Uh, and governments need to recognize, incentivize, and reward for our practice adoption and facilitate the collection of statistical data on the practices so that we can relate them to outcomes. Scientists have a role in defining and describing for our practice standards and quantifying their outcomes. We have some practice standards in Canada for 4R. They need to be considered a work in progress and something that can be continuously improved. Food industry needs to recognize and reward for our practices as well in sustainability standards. And investors need to invest in technologies, businesses, and organizations that support 4R. So in summary today, the scope for 4R to sustainably reduce emissions from fertilizer use is substantial. The pr principles and practices deliver recognized benefits. A sound 4R program needs to track practices and outcomes, and the outcomes need to include things like we can measure on the farm, nitrogen use efficiency, nitrogen surpluses, and soil health, uh, looking at its role particularly in uh, the soil carbon attribute as a greenhouse gas sink. And the monitoring, reporting, and validation of this kind of a program requires collaboration. If you'd like to learn more, the issue brief is available at the URL indicated here, sprpn.org issue briefs. Thank you kindly for your attention, and I hope that I'll be able to um, uh, answer questions as they arise. Fantastic. Thank, thank Fantastic. you for joining us thank from a hotel room. Where, are you, room right and now, where are you right now again? I'm in Indianapolis. Just There was no direct flight from here uh, where I spoke yesterday on the same topic almost, but there was no direct flight from Ind Indianapolis to Winnipeg, unfortunately. Yeah, so it's unfortunate that Tom couldn't be here in person, but I'm glad that he was able to pre-record his presentation and still be able to be here in spirit virtually. Um, okay, so do we have any questions from the audience for Tom? I have seven. Tam well, you guys are thinking, Tammy has a question. Okay. So China's emissions compared to Canada are high. Its emissions are basically one of the problems is the low end use efficiency but it started to improve in the last decade and Tom doesn't have any specific numbers. With the drought in Saskatchewan and Alberta, the losses or nitrous oxide emissions are lower, which was reflective of the map that Marla showed earlier where you know we're less of a problem than some spots. Um, and there is a follow-up to that, Tom, which is why are we not seeing that in the map as we know our emissions are low and I, I think we were relatively low in emissions compared to some other areas, but maybe not as reflective as, as what Garth is hoping for. Do you want to make a comment, Tom, or do you want me to just keep going with the question and answer? answer. I'm not quite sure which map you're referring to there. Um, Canada's per hectare emissions are fairly low um, because of the fact, well, with prairie agriculture, our, our yields are lower than China's as well. Um, but at, but at the same time, uh, what we were looking at is uh, the, the emissions trends relative, relative to efficiency. China indeed has a much poorer uh, nitrogen use efficiency in its crop production, um, but it has been starting to improve. Emissions from manufacturing and transportation of N inhibitors, um, are we actually making a difference? And so Tom mentioned that, you know, DCD is a molecule that's not much different than urea, so the greenhouse gas footprint might be similar, but we're not really uh, super sure of the answer to that question currently. Um, gosh, there's a lot. Um, so farmer consultation is important in understanding how decisions are made. Scientific overview won't make change. The actual changes must happen at the farm. Have we spoken to farmers? And Tom, you say you agree completely. Your communication with farmers is limited uh, compared to uh, the geography that you're trying to cover, considering you're in Indianapolis and we're here in Manitoba. So uh, do you want to comment on that one any further? Any further? Uh, no, I agree. Farmer consultation is important, and I do try to visit farmers wherever I can, but uh, I have responsibilities in Canada, in the U.S., and also with EFA worldwide, so that, that does limit my ability to get directly involved with all the farmers impacted. Nevertheless, um, 
I see a couple of other new questions that I hadn't uh, written an answer to yet. Uh, yes, yeah, so the one about the nitrogen use efficiency, why don't we have the seed companies involved in this? Speaking as someone who is working for a seed company, I know that nitrogen use efficiency is one of our breeding efforts. So uh, they are involved, and if they aren't involved, they better get on board. Get on board. The, this, is a, this is a very good point that improving nitrogen use efficiency takes much more than just the fertilizer industries applying the right source at the right rate, time, and place. It does in involve genetic improvement and it involves improvements in crop management as well. And we all need to work on this together. And that comes out a lot more in the uh, issue brief that the scientific panel for responsible plant nutrition published on 4R. So thank you very much, Tom, again, for joining us today and providing that presentation. We really appreciate it. I'm sure you are accessible by email and Twitter and all those fun things if anybody wants to track you down. So again, thanks to Tom.